We are fascinated by Neanderthals because of what they reveal about who we are and could have been. It's alluring to imagine them as Adam and Eve in the garden, coexisting peacefully with the environment and one another. If so, perhaps human ills, specifically our territoriality and conflicts, are not innate, but rather the products of contemporary society. However, paleontology and biology present a more somber picture. Neanderthals were likely skilled fighters and dangerous warriors, rivaled only by modern humans, and they were certainly not pacifists. Territorialism is a trait of predatory land mammals, particularly pack hunters. The Neanderthals were cooperative big game hunters, just like lions, wolves, and modern humans. These predators, at the top of the food chain, have few predators of their own, and competition drives conflict over hunting grounds. The same issue affected our big-headed evolutionary cousins, if predators didn't limit their population, conflict would have resulted. Indeed, humans have a long history of territorial behavior. Intense territorial conflicts also exist among chimpanzees, our closest living relatives. Male chimpanzees regularly form groups to ambush males from opposing bands, a behavior that is startlingly similar to human warfare. This suggests that 7 million years ago, in the common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans, cooperative aggression first appeared. If so, cooperative aggression tendencies would have been passed down to Neanderthals. Modern humans frequently experience interpersonal conflict, and Neanderthals were very similar to us. Our DNA is 99.7% the same, and our skull and skeletal structures are remarkably similar. Neanderthals were astonishingly similar to us in terms of behavior. They carved images into stone shrines, made fire, buried their dead, made jewelry out of animal teeth and seashells, and painted pictures on cave walls. Neanderthals probably shared many of our destructive instincts as well, if they shared so many of our creative ones. A skilled big game hunter, Neanderthal man used spears to hunt deer, ibex, elk, bison, even rhinos, and mammoths. To think that they would have been hesitant to use these weapons if their families and lands were in danger defies comprehension. Archaeology suggests that these conflicts were frequent. The evidence from archaeology shows that Neanderthal lives were anything but tranquil. Warfare during the prehistoric period leaves traces due to the effectiveness of clubs as quick, potent, and precise weapons. Prehistoric Homo sapiens and Neanderthals frequently exhibit skull trauma. In point of fact, a new study reveals that a vicious attack on a Neanderthal caused a fracture in a 40,000-year-old skull. A computer reconstruction of the Saint Césaire skull, discovered in France, led to this conclusion. According to the authors, their findings have significant ramifications for comprehending Neanderthals, social interactions with modern humans. The skull's computer tomographic imaging and computer-assisted reconstruction showed that the cranial vault had a healed fracture. When paleopathological and forensic diagnostic standards are used, the bony scar provides clear proof that a sharp object struck the person during an act of interpersonal conflict. These findings strengthen the case that Neanderthals employed tools not only for gathering and processing food, but also in other contexts. It is hypothesized that a significant factor in the evolution of hominid social behavior may have been the high intragroup damage potential inherent to weapons. From X-ray images of the fragmented skull, which most likely belonged to a young Neanderthal man, anthropologists created the virtual reconstruction. Near the middle of the head, the researchers found a bony scar that they claim resembles damage from a sharp object. The scar's straight edge and orientation suggest that the man was attacked with a handle-equipped tool or weapon, like a stone axe. Because the scar is on the man's crown of the head, other potential causes, like falling on a sharp edge, getting hurt while hunting, or getting hit by a rock, seem less likely. Neanderthals lived in family groups and interacted with other humans infrequently so a conflict within the group is the most likely cause. However, there is a more sinister possibility, conflict with modern humans. Nonetheless, the analysis also suggests that the man most likely lived to tell about it. The skull's bone structure suggests that the scar had at least a few months to heal. Researchers hypothesize that the man's family's care allowed him to survive. If accurate, this interpretation backs up the claim made by some anthropologists that early modern humans, the modern human Cro-Magnons of France and Neanderthals, who vanished about 40,000 years ago, shared a social intelligence that was comparable. 
The skull also bears a remarkable similarity to the 50,000-year-old Amud Neanderthal skull from Israel. It should be noted that Neanderthal skulls vary tremendously over their 300,000-year existence, and therefore their appearances varies tremendously. The Saint Césaire skeleton is fragmented and partially eroded, but the reconstructed long bone morphology allowed important deductions about the phyletic status and behavioral specializations of this individual. The specimen's craniomandibular morphology largely matches the classical Neanderthal type. A meat rich diet similar to that of earlier Neanderthals and contemporary hunting societies is suggested by tooth microwear analysis, although cross sectional biomechanical analysis suggests locomotor patterns closer to those of early modern humans than of classic Neanderthals. The morphology of the well preserved right femoral shaft indicates Neanderthal type hyperarctic body proportions. Therefore, this skull could have belonged to a Neanderthal sapiens hybrid, or may have been one of the last surviving humans of his kind in France. The majority of the skeletal fragments have been located despite the fact that it is severely crushed. The person demonstrates a range of traits common to European Neanderthals. But its teeth are small for a Neanderthal, and its brow region and jaws are lightly built, all of which point to a decrease in the face's size from earlier Neanderthals. Additionally, the limb bones resemble early modern human limb bones, indicating a change in the arm use and locomotion patterns. According to a pattern also observed in Central European late Neanderthals, these anatomical changes in relation to ancestral Neanderthals are consistent. Certain behavioral changes suggested by the anatomical changes may be supported by the tools discovered at Saint Césaire. Some researchers have come to the conclusion that Neanderthals were not only capable of but also responsible for some cultural developments that are typically associated with early modern humans as a result of the Saint Césaire discovery. This claim is supported by later finds at other locations in France. It is significant because it was discovered alongside tools and other items that were previously only connected to early modern humans, and not Neanderthals. Despite the site's inland location, a marine shell was discovered buried with the person. The evolutionary, paleodemographic, and cultural relationships between native Neanderthal populations and the early modern human newcomers during the early Upper Paleolithic in Europe were the subject of an intense and ongoing debate sparked by these discoveries. Scientists discovered a healed fracture in the cranial vault while reconstructing the skull. This bony scar provides clear evidence of the impact of a sharp object, which may have been used against the person during an active interpersonal conflict, according to paleopathological diagnostic standards. The skeletal remains found at Saint Césaire belong to a young adult, probably a male. The skeleton's association with marine shells, and the local inhomogeneity in the distribution of rocks and tools at the site where it was discovered may be signs of an intentional burial, even though the excavation turned up no evidence of a burial pit. Fragments of the skeleton and the limb bones, some of which were discovered in anatomical connection, make up the post-cranium. Except for a few isolated teeth, the left cranial half of the skull, which was lying on its right side with the upper and lower jaws in anatomical association, is missing. The degradation and loss of these components is most likely the result of brief exposure to the elements and weathering of the sediments uppermost layers, where the fossil was embedded. According to the study, the scar's nearly straight border indicates that the person most likely sustained a lesion from a blade-shaped object. The resulting slash in the cranial vault is preserved over a length of 68 mm on its right side. The fossil's left side was lost during the process of fossilization. The injury deepened most close to the coronal suture, which corresponds to the primary site of impact, based on the degree of bone remodeling along the margin. Most closely resembling the pattern of direct, acute trauma matches this morphology. Under these biomechanical circumstances, the impacting object's high, but localized stresses, cause the scalp and the external layer of the bone to be punctured or cut, and the bone fragments to be separated from the internal lamina. In fact, the Saint Césaire specimen shows that the internal bone layer was only partially severed near the periphery of the slash, whereas it was fractured and dislocated at the primary site of the impact. It is less likely that the slash's linear fracture was caused by blunt trauma, because blunt objects' compressive forces cause non-local deformation of the cranial vault, which typically causes multiple radial and tangential fractures to form around the center of impact. Since bone healing doesn't become apparent until two to three weeks after a traumatic event, it can be assumed that the victim lived through the injury for at least a few months, 
making it likely that there was a direct link between the trauma and the victim's demise. Critics counter that an accident could just as easily account for the bump on the hominid's head. It is possible to imagine various scenarios in which the Saint Césaire injury could have happened, evaluate their relative likelihood, and discuss their behavioral and motivational implications, by using forensic criteria that were initially created for trauma analysis in extant and archaeological populations. Assuming the victim was standing upright, the slash's anteroposterior orientation and its apical position suggest a blow or a thrust was applied to the victim from the front, or the back. These spatial relationships point to a deliberate action that was carried out using a tool rather than a natural object. Comparative forensic evidence suggests that accidental trauma typically affects the sides of the cranial vault, as opposed to the apical location of intentional injuries. Accidental injury, such as falling onto a sharp edge, a rockfall, or an unintentional blow, such as resulting from a hunting incident, are less likely explanations. According to comparative data from historical populations, cranial vault fractures caused by interpersonal conflict are relatively common. Direct contact with another person is the most frugal option given the injury's typical apical location in the Saint Césaire skull. The harm could have been brought on by conflict behavior between groups or even between specific subgroups, according to theory. The first scenario is the most likely one, because most interpersonal interactions within socially organized species take place at the group level. Since there were few encounters between different groups, both intra- and interspecific, during the late Pleistocene, mutual avoidance may have been the best course of action for resolving any potential conflict. What's more? it must be taken into account that uneven resource distribution might have resulted in transient between group competition. The motivations behind the conflict in which the Saint Césaire Neanderthal participated also need to be taken into account. The reasons behind an act of conflict can range from a planned attack to a quick argument that results from a temporary conflict between people, such as one over social standing, access to potential partners, or intragroup resources. The immediate consequences of the trauma were probably serious, implying heavy bleeding, cerebral commotion, and temporary impairment. In general, a likely scenario for the interpersonal conflict in Saint Césaire is intragroup tempers with available weaponry. It is possible that the person experienced these negative effects on their own, but it is likely that they were at least partially prevented by initial intragroup support. The frequency and pattern of skeletal injury in Neanderthals were shown to be different from fossil and contemporary human populations. The overall incidence of trauma was relatively high and concentrated to the head and neck. However, it appears that the overall frequency of trauma was lower in modern human populations, whereas the proportion of head and neck injuries was probably as high as in the Neanderthals. Differences in the pattern of trauma between Neanderthals and modern humans from the Upper Paleolithic have not yet been investigated systematically. It is important to note that young Neanderthal specimens also show signs of craniofacial trauma, given that injuries tend to accumulate over a person's lifetime and older people typically show a greater number of lesions. Therefore, the increased frequency of trauma may not only be due to the high risk of injury when hunting medium, to large-sized game up close, but also to a physically demanding and stressful upbringing from early on to genetic stages. This fossil sheds light on many aspects of Neanderthal behavior, assuming that the Saint Césaire individual was injured in an active intragroup conflict, and later received some assistance during healing. This is consistent with the idea that Neanderthals were able to support severely handicapped people for protracted periods of time, and that this behavioral ability existed during the Middle Pleistocene. Nonetheless, we must assume that Neanderthals used aggressive, and integrative behavioral traits as tools in a web of social interactions to inflict wounds and care for the injured, depending on the situation. Due to their high effectiveness in interpersonal conflict, and the fact that they added an extra layer of complexity to social interactions, implements likely played a significant role in this fundamental pattern of behavior in early humans. Therefore, it can be assumed that during the early Upper Paleolithic, there was not a significant transition from behavioral patterns specific to Neanderthals to those specific to modern humans. This process was probably cross-species and prominently patterned in terms of time and space. Although genetic, developmental, and morphological evidence points to a species-level separation between Neanderthals and modern humans, their methods for striking a balance between aggressive and cooperative behavioral patterns were largely comparable.